I thought that uh, we would do a little bit this morning of uh, what you're not supposed to do. Isn't that why we go to church, to do things that we're not supposed to do? Isn't that how it works? Uh, two things that you never discuss in polite company are politics and, and religion. Well, I was fairly certain we would talk about religion this morning, so I thought, why not? Let's add politics and we'll just kill two birds with one stone, shall we? Uh, we are going to talk about politics and religion this morning because there are a few things that are as distracting, as engaging, as fascinating, as irritating, and yes, as entertaining as a presidential election in the United States of America. Like it or lump it, uh, it is a part of our culture and it is a pastime that never seems to really have an end. Uh, the next election cycle begins when? Well, it begins as soon as the last person is installed. Well, probably just after they're voted. We don't even wait for inauguration. We just immediately start campaigning for the next, uh, uh, the next election. And so, indeed, unless you have been absent in a very peculiar sort of way, you probably have noticed that the news cycles have been dominated by presidential election politics. Uh, you know, last year, the debates narrowing the field slowly down. Uh, Adventists in particular kind of wonder, hmm, what would it be like to have one of our own stashed up there? Uh, and of course, that question has been answered. Uh, the field has narrowed. Uh, nobody knows what exactly is going to happen in November. But it is nonetheless true that presidential politics, in the United States at least, can be extraordinarily entertaining. And you know what? It's always been that way for generations. Uh, stories told about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, what was he? President 25? Was he a 25th president? Something like that? Forgive me if I'm wrong. Don't quote me on that. T Teddy Roosevelt, running for office, he was giving a stump speech somewhere, campaigning as only Teddy Roosevelt could. Uh, and uh, there was a heckler that uh, kept interrupting him by saying, I'm a Democrat. Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, was a Republican. And the heckler would, would just say kind of randomly, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. And finally, Teddy Roosevelt engaged the heckler, and he said, why are you a Democrat? The man stood proudly and said, because my grandfather was a Democrat, and my father was a Democrat, and that's why I'm a Democrat. Well, Teddy Roosevelt was no stranger to this repartee, and so he looks him squarely in the eye and says, and if your grandfather was a, and then he used a rather descriptive word for a donkey, I'll just use donkey since this is a family show, okay? If your grandfather was a donkey and your father was a donkey, what would you be then? <laughs> and the heckler, without missing a beat, said, a Republican. Now, no offense to those of you that lean Republican, because the truth be told, there are multiple stories on every side that could be told similar to that one. Uh, presidential politics, this is where uh, uh, insults are hurled, uh, where, where accusations are made. And it's been most entertaining seeing the accusations, for instance, that have turned out to not be true. It's been interesting to see the accusations that have turned out to be true. And all across the way, we have this very bizarre mix. On the one hand, sometimes we have the height of silliness in American politics and at the same time this is important I mean this matters you know from a human perspective there are a few things that matter more again humanly speaking there are a few things probably that matter more than who is sitting as the commander of chief commander-in-chief of the United States of America we remain, uh, however much we may try, it sometimes seems like to get out of it, we remain uh, uh, one of the most, if not the most, uh, powerful military power in the world. Uh, this huge economy that has so much effect around the world, foreign policy, uh, uh, whether we intervene or not, affects millions and even, yes, billions of people. And the person who sits in the president's chair, he or she, whatever the case turns out to be, will make an impact on history. And it's because of this weird mixture of at times silliness and at times seriousness that the thoughtful Christian often has to make a decision. How will they respond? 
How does a Christian respond in an election year? What do they do? You know, historically, particularly over the last 30 years, Christians seem to have kind of been polarized on this. They, they choose one of two extremes. On the one hand, they, they may choose uh, to, to completely disengage. They will say, well, you know, they're all crooks anyway, so I'm not even going to bother. I'm not even going to vote. I'm just going to disengage from the whole process, let somebody else take care of this mess. I know the Lord is going to do what he wants to do, so boom, I'm off in my corner. Other Christians have said, no, we are going to fully engage. Uh, they will register as a member of a particular party. They will contribute funds to their candidate of choice. Uh, they'll volunteer their time in their city or their county, perhaps even becoming officers with their local committee, etc., etc. What is it that a Christian someone who is serious about this book and following Jesus Christ, how should a Christian respond in an election year? Let's do a little digging this morning. Hope you have a Bible with you. Let's put up here some foundational principles. And I want to begin in Romans chapter 13. Now, I need to tell you ahead of time, you know, they say that preaching is the art of what not to say, and so I am intentionally leaving out some things that I'm dying to share with you. But for the sake of time, uh, that we may not be here until next Sabbath, uh, I'm just going to narrow the field here down to a handful of things, uh, knowing that this is not an exhaustive lift. Some foundational principles that are found in the Word of God that can help to guide us, and then I want to give you just a few things about what to actually do when you go in November to cast your vote. We'll see what we can do. Remember this whole religion and politics things we're not supposed to do? Let's, let's see if we can put a happy face on this, all right? Uh, Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. If you have ever studied this topic of how a Christian uh, should, we, should interact with government, politics, etc., you know that this is an unavoidable place in Scripture. Paul here, writing to the church in Rome, knew a thing or two about politics and how Christians should respond to politics. And he gives here uh, probably the longest longest, at least in one spot here, the longest dissertation on what a Christian should do. Verse 1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, that sounds troubling, doesn't it? We'll come back to that here in just a moment. The authorities that exist have been established by God, just in case we missed the point. Verse 2, consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant, wow, to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe tax, taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Hmm. Several points come out of this. Uh, foundational principle number one. God's organized people, in this case the church, are no longer the source of civil government. God's organized people, previously this would have been the nation of Israel, now because we're in the New Testament, obviously this is the Christian church, they are no longer the source of civil government. Now, we need to be really careful here with this text because it appears here, you know, God has made this switch, right? No longer is there this, this, this government wrapped up in, in his people. Instead, other people are now in charge of Christians in civil matters here. And the language that Paul uses can appear to be overly strong. God has instituted these things. And the reason that's troublesome, I suppose, is obvious. Are you uh, Adolf Hitler? Pol Pot in Cambodia? Idi Amin in Africa? God instituted all these things? No. No, what God did, let's be clear, what God did is make an allowance for there to be a civil government outside of his people. In other words, there is this opportunity that people have, whether they are believers in God or not, to govern. And it is God's design that it be that way. 
That doesn't mean that he approves of everything that those that are in office do. Far from it. Uh, God grieved when Adolf Hitler did his particular things. Uh, God is not in favor of those things, but the fact that there is this opportunity to govern civil matters, yes, God is the one that set that up, and we need to be respectful of that. And I'll tell you what, if you think that discussing religion and politics this morning can be risky, you should have seen what the Jewish listeners to Paul's words, would, how they would have responded. I mean, this was the pinnacle of heresy for most Jews in those days. Submit to who? Who was the government back then? To Rome. Submit to Rome. You're out of your mind. We don't do that. And in fact, uh, if you're familiar with the writings of Josephus, uh, Josephus was, uh, he was a Jew, uh, but he also managed to work in some reasonably high echelons of Roman government. Uh, and he was a prolific writer. In fact, that was part of his job. He was to be uh, a historian for the court. And so he, he wrote down many things, including how the Jews responded politically. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. I mean, the stories you read, I'm not going to give you the graphic detail that Josephus does, but, but the uprisings that the Jews uh, would engage in against the Romans were, were, were terribly bloody. I, it, was, it was a cruel time already, and so when the Jews engaged in this in literal warfare with the Romans, it was, it was truly a bloody mess. And why did they do it? Why did the Jews push back so strongly? Not the Christians, but the Jews. In part, they did it because they still believed that civil government and God's people were one. For instance, the military was a religious function for them. If the Romans oppressed them and suppressed religious belief, for them the answer was one from the state of Israel, as it were. They should respond militarily. It was appropriate to fight back, even, even bloodily so, to kill Romans because there was something they were familiar with. We refer to it now as a theocracy. It's where God is the head of government. Not just religious matters, but civil matters as well. This is how the Old Testament operated for a very long time. God was the, was the one who ordered all things religious, and God, through the elders of Israel, was also the one who ordered all things civil. The two were together. And so God comes to the place where all of that went away. At the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, there's this incredible scene where, where, where Stephen looks up into heaven and Jesus is standing there at the right hand of the Father. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, all the symbolism there. It's, it's incredibly rich what's happening. Long story short, by standing at the throne of the Father and given the words that Stephen has just said, it is very clear that the special covenant between God and Israel is broken at that time. The Jews were the one that broke it. God, Jesus simply stood to ratify their decision. They were no longer oh, the only special people of God. Now everyone of every ethnic background, Jew or not, could be part of the family of God. That's why most of us, I would guess, that are here today. This is why if you're part of the family of God, here it is. Because God broke his special covenant with the Jews and now expends, extends it to everyone, including the Jews, if they wish to follow Jesus Christ. But at that moment, when Jesus stood at the right hand of the Father, the theocracy was done. No longer would, would God's people, now the Christian church, be involved in governing civil affairs. Instead, that duty would be get granted to others, and God would no longer be explicitly revealing and accomplishing His will through the civil authorities. Now, He would work through the civil authorities, but in a very different role than He had in the past, because now there was something that today we call a wall of separation between what? Between church and state. Uh, which brings up a very interesting question. At least I find it to be fascinating. Why? You know, most Americans today, if you talk to them about the separation of church and state, uh, blessedly, most of them will still say, oh yeah, we do that. You know, this, this is how it's supposed to be, right? Not so in those days. In fact, think about it. Think carefully. If you were a Jew listening to Paul, 
Wouldn't the question come to your mind, why now this separation between the two? For more than 1,000 years previously, there had not been a separation between church and state. It was God's plan that there not be a separation between church and state. Why change now? Well, to find out, let's take a look back here at Romans 13. Let's look at... Uh, Verses 3 and 4. It says, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now this brings us to foundational principle number two. Civil government is to be a tourniquet on bad behavior, not a transformer of human hearts. You follow me? You know what a tourniquet is, right? Uh, blessedly, probably most of you have never had to have one. Uh, I can't think of a time, amazingly, me, the medical showcase, I have not actually had to have a tourniquet before. But I am told, if, for instance, you lose a limb and you are bleeding profusely, they will take something, a belt, uh, your ripped jeans, anything at the time, and they'll wrap it really tight around that, that limb that's left to stop the bleeding. You're not going to stop it all. You can't do that, but it's a tourniquet to stop the major stuff. Well, that's how government here, according to the Word of God, is to function. One of their primary reasons for existing is to be a tourniquet on bad behavior, to make for a peaceful society as much as possible, to keep the bad guys at bay and let the rest of the people live. That is one of their primary functions according to Scripture. And notice it does not say that government is responsible for transforming human hearts. Who does that? Okay, Jesus does. Jesus does. This is extremely important when we think about politics. Politics are extremely limited. Civil government is extremely limited. It cannot create utopia. It cannot reform society at a heart level. It cannot usher in a new age of peace and prosperity. This is why so often, whether it's in this country or some other country, people say this is the most impactful election that we have ever had. Well, you know, that may or may not be true. But in the grand scheme of the kingdom of God, the level of importance is relatively low. Now, in human affairs, it's very high. What will save this country and any country is Jesus Christ, not the legislature. Amen. Amen. That's a fact. Sometimes Christians, we are prone to forget that. We get all caught up in the excitement of the political side of things. No, no, no. There is not even a hint in Scripture, much less in what we're reading in Romans 13, that the government is supposed to be about transforming hearts. You know, it seems that we, as a species are extremely optimistic when it comes to government, particularly around election time. Uh, you can look back at, uh, at, at various uh, uh, things that have happened in other countries. Communism, when it has been introduced in other nations, almost always has at its root this desire to create a utopia. Everyone you know, will all be equal. Everything will be provided for us. Everyone will have a job. Everyone will be well fed. You'll have your, 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 you know, your 1.2 children and a half car in the garage and a white picket fence. Everybody will have what they need. Everyone will be at peace. As though government could actually change the human heart from which things like discord come. And the answer is they can't. It's not even their job. God has not ordained it to be that way. God instead has said, one of your primary tasks, and to be honest, one of your few tasks, civil government now, is to be this tourniquet on bad behavior, to punish the evildoer, to, to stop people, aside from religion. Because government cannot transform the heart. They are simply there to help control bad behavior. Now, notice how this helps explain why it is that God now wants this separation between church and state. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, please. Verse 1. It's page 837 in your blue Bible. Page 837, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now, same writer here talking. This is Paul again, this time talking to his uh, young understudy, Timothy. And he is going to talk again here about politics, about the government. And here's what he has to say. He says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, 
and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And just in case we're wondering who everyone is, verse 2, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, I don't know of any place in Scripture that makes it more clear. Let me just put it on the screen here. One of the prime reasons that God wants a wall of separation between church and state is so that people can better come to faith in Him. In other words, it serves an indirect but very important purpose. It is to create an environment, not a religious environment, but in an environment in which religion can grow freely. You follow me? That this is, I'm not splitting a fine hair here. This is a very important distinction. God here is saying, through his servant Paul, very clearly, you know, we get there to, uh, uh, to uh, verse 3, this is good. Okay, so we want to intercede for the kings, all those in authority, President Obama, anybody who's a, a governor, a senator, etc. We're supposed to intercede for them, make requests, prayers, thanksgiving, etc. Verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior. And we could say, well, well, how come? Why would it be so pleasing? Verse 4, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Translation. After Jesus died on the cross and rose to heaven again. God knew that the old form of government would leave him very vulnerable to one of Satan's original accusations. And that is, God, you are unfair. You are unfair. Your law is unkeepable, yet you ask people to keep it. Uh, you, you force people to do things. People cannot voluntarily follow you it's because uh, they're, they're, they're afraid of the threats of punishment that you, that you will give them. And so there's this, there's this compulsion that's in your government. You are unfair. Well, you know what? When it was confined to the Jewish people, when the theocracy was confined to the Jewish people, God apparently could run that risk. But now that it's time for the gospel to go global, regardless of ethnicity, God in essence is saying, I do not want there to be even a hint of compulsion in my kingdom. I do not want there to be a combination of church and state. Instead, we will delegate the power of the sword, for instance, to a civil government. The sword will be taken from the church that people will see that there is not a sword in my hand. I do not put a sword at people's throats and compel them to join my kingdom. No, 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 no. Instead, they are free to choose according to the dictates of their conscience. And thus there will be a separation of church and state. Now, is that risky? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Again, the Hitlers, Pol Pots of the world, etc. tell us, yeah, it's risky. But it is nonetheless God's plan. Which brings us squarely to foundational principle number three. Take a look at Revelation 13, please. Verse 11 and 12. Foundational principle number one. God's organized people, in this case the church, are no longer to be the source of civil government. We do not do that any longer. Number two, civil government is to be a tourniquet on bad behavior, not a transformer of human hearts. Only God can do that. For principle number three, we need to look here at Revelation 13. This is on page, what page is that on? Let me see here. I had it here. 874, all the way there in the back of your Bible. Page 874, Revelation 13, verses 11 and 12. We have here this scene. John uh, is, is in vision, and he's seeing this vision of the days that we live in and the days just beyond, and he sees a couple of beast powers. Beasts represent uh, uh, re uh, organizations, governments, uh, often religious and political mixed together, as we shall see here. Revelation 13, verse 11, John says, Then I saw another beast, another power, coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants, key word here, worship 
the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Now, how, how, how many people here are compelled to worship? Okay, it's a global thing, isn't it? This, this is not regional. This is not just the U.S. or Japan or China or any one country. This is a global thing. Now, understand clearly what that means. We, we don't have time to unpack all of the symbolism that's here. John is describing the very end, the days that lie just before us. He sees these two superpowers that are not just political but religious as well. We know that because they enforce worship. They don't enforce legislation per se. They enforce worship. And so there is this, there's this global movement at the end to force people to worship in the way that these two powers think people should worship. Now even if we know nothing else about the interpretation of this particular text, we do know very clearly a third foundational principle. And here it is. In any important matter of state, including the election of a new president, religious liberty is the most important consideration. Amen. The most important. At the end of time, it is religious liberty that is at the core, politically speaking. Okay, I'm, I'm speaking here from, from a human government perspective. Politically speaking, religious liberty is the issue at the end. How you worship, whether or not you can worship in the way that you choose, this is the issue from a political perspective. Number one, and therefore in any political consideration, in any political situation, including a presidential election, which yea verily lies just before us, the number one consideration, most important, is religious liberty. Now, some of you right now might be scratching your heads and saying, oh, wait, wait, wait a second. What about social issues? What about terrorism? You know, those are extremely important. Uh, it's interesting, uh, again, being out in uh, Central California here this last week, uh, they have some pieces of legislation that are still kind of uh, bowling back and forth. Uh, uh, they have not yet become law, but appear to be on the verge of becoming law. Uh, legislation that could very easily lead to an inability of Adventist and other religious schools uh, having the curriculum that they wish and choosing the staff that they wish that religious considerations would no longer be taken into account. If you're going to receive any federal dollar, excuse me, any state dollars, uh, uh, Cal Grant, for instance, if you're going to go to school in California, uh, you would not be able to do that at a religious institution. You know what they say, like it or lump it, as California goes, so goes the rest of the nation. Uh, there's a lot of people praying right now. You probably should join them. Uh, that the Lord's will will be done and that this wave will be pushed back. Religious liberty is hugely important. Social issues, yes. I mean, we think about uh, you know, laws regarding sexual orientation, the legalities that may impact our schools and our churches from that. Is that important? Yes, it is. It's extremely important. I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges that Adventist education may face here in the next decade if we're still here for 10 years. Uh, is terrorism. You know, I, I was on vacation, but every time you turn the TV on, it sure didn't seem like it. Because somebody's getting killed somewhere around the globe. I mean, just alarming regularity over the last month. Is terrorism important? Of course it is. Of course it is. Should it factor into who, you, who we elect as president? Of course it should. And number one, more important than any of those issues I just said, more important than any other issue, politically speaking, is religious liberty. Because, follow me carefully now, if there is no religious liberty, if it goes away, then so does the chance for a Bible-based morality. You follow me? And if a Bible-based morality goes away, there is no longer any biblical basis to assess things like social issues and terrorism, much less come to an adequate conclusion regarding them. Reminds me of some famous words. Uh, tell me where these words are from. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Gettysburg Address. Poor Bill Clinton. Uh, poor guy. He once attributed this to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, 
But, uh, he was trying hard. He was trying hard. But uh, no, this is uh, probably most people would recognize this as coming from uh, the mouth of Lincoln at the Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address. Famous thing. Uh, many of you probably had to uh, memorize it, as many students still do. This powerful speech uh, that Lincoln gave, very, very short, and it includes these words towards the end a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now, almost certainly these words are not original with Lincoln. In fact, for instance, 30 years earlier, a guy by the name of Daniel Webster, a famous American statement, statesman, he almost verbatim quoted this phrase uh, when, when he was debating uh, another politician. And in fact, some have even suggested that there is evidence that this phrase goes way, way, way back to the 14th century, 1384, to a guy by the name of William Tyndale. Or, or excuse me, I'm sorry, forgive me. John Wycliffe. I get my, my, my Reformation people sometimes mixed up here. John Wycliffe. Now, John Wycliffe uh, was a f famous Bible translator. And in fact, one of the things that really got Wycliffe upset was the fact that in churches all over the world, there were Bibles that nobody could read and nobody could take home. Now, now, again, things are different now in, in the Roman Catholic Church today. But in those days, the Bible was literally chained to the pulpit because it was considered to be too dangerous uh, for average people uh, to, get, to, to have in their own hands. So who knows what they might learn, right? Well, to make doubly sure, most of the Bibles that were made in those days were only available in Latin. And the common people did not speak Latin. And so even if you wanted to get out your, your, your chain snippers and somehow get that Bible off the pulpit, you couldn't do anything with it. You couldn't read it. And John Wycliffe could not countenance that any longer because this was the Word of God to mankind. This was the Word of God, this living, breathing Word that you know, divides bone and marrow, where Jesus still speaks to His people, and nobody could understand Him. And so He went about to do what in many countries of the world at that time was illegal. He translated the Bible into English, into the native vernacular. And it is said, I know there is some debate about this, but it is said by a number of scholars that He wrote in the foreword, the prologue, to one of His translations, that this Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, for the people. 500 years before Lincoln would utter those words in the Gettysburg Address. Now, whether or not it is an apocryphal story, the fact of the matter is, is that the sentiments express John Wycliffe's sentiments very, very well. He saw the chaining of that Bible to those pulpits in those days as symbols of people being chained to a church-state government institution. Because in those days, sadly, church and state were not separated. Uh, the Roman church was very much involved with civil government. And John Wycliffe saw them as one and the same. And so to set them free, that they might be set free from tyranny, from the tyranny of the state and the church that had so unholily combined. He didn't send an army. John Wycliffe didn't try to rally soldiers together. He didn't get military weapons together. Instead, he said, I will translate the Bible. I will translate the Bible because this will enable there to be a government that people can live with free from tyranny. Hear it and hear it well. The United States government as constituted in the beginning, proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that this particular saying is correct. You could not get a United States of America from Buddhism. You could not get a United States of America from Hinduism. You could not get a United States of America from Islam. You could not get a United States of America from atheism. Far from it. But you could get it from biblical principle. Not evangelical Christianity even, but biblical principle, yes. And indeed, they did. Our founding fathers did develop a nation that was built on biblical principle, a separation of church and state. You know, in my opinion, for whatever it's worth, this is why the Founding Fathers established a government that is more notable for its absence in its citizens' lives than for its presence. You follow me? They came from a place where they knew firsthand what tyranny was. 
There was not religious freedom. There was not a, a, a freedom of association. There was not this freedom to follow the dictates of one's own conscience. They knew what it meant to have oppression, to have a monarchy intruding into every facet of their, quote, subjects' lives, including religion. And so they said, no, 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 we're going to follow the principles that are in this particular book. A separation of church and state so that there will be basic freedoms, yes, that the state enforces. The civil government will have some authority. Uh, there will be provisions that are made in order for us in times of war to gather together. Basic human freedoms will be protected. The sword will indeed belong with the civil government. But each citizen will be able to follow the dictates of their conscience that they might be able to pursue life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And all of this hinges on religious liberty. And if religious liberty ever goes away, everything else will crumble with it. So, what is a Christian to do in an election year? What should you do in November? Well, uh, I can't imagine ever telling you which candidate to vote for. So if you're waiting for that at the end of the sermon, you can now be disappointed. That's not going to happen, all right? Uh, but I am going to tell you very quickly here some very specific things. Number one, vote. In light of what we have seen, it ought to be clear that there are global issues at stake, even in politics. So you need to vote. You have a responsibility. We cannot, as Christians, be salt and light in the world if we disengage from this political process that has been granted to us. Okay? So you need to vote. Uh, by the way, don't vote for the candidate that you think will bring in the end of time the fastest. Uh, we have some specific counsel, actually. It's interesting. Uh, you know, we, we chuckle, but uh, many an Adventist has, has thought that would be a great idea. Let's just speed stuff up, right? You know, put in so-and-so, and they'll bring in the Sunday laws tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, uh, don't do that. Ellen White said very specifically, don't do that, because, uh, just very practically speaking, as we have been talking, we need to create this environment in which good things can happen, not bad. We cannot vote for evil, okay? Don't vote for evil. That's not the way that the Lord works. It's not the way that we should work. Number two, Avoid aligning too much with any one party. Avoid aligning too much with any one party. Now, some of you might be thinking, now, wait, 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 where, where in the Bible does it say that? Uh, the answer is explicitly nowhere. There is, no, there is no text that says, thou shalt not become a registered Republican or a registered Democrat, or whatever it is that you want to register for. It's not there, but there's some pretty strong indications in the Bible that this is indeed the case, that we should not too strongly align with any particular party. For instance, in the New Testament, when speaking of politics, the Bible always speaks in distant terms. Always. In fact, the Christian is almost reacting to government as opposed to being proactive in government. Now, I'm not saying that a Christian can never be a government official. I'm not saying that. I am saying when the Bible speaks, it's always at arm's length. There is no text that says, thou shalt run for office. Thou shalt register as your favorite political party. There's nothing in there. Instead, there, there, there is this, there's this gap between. Because you see, civil government is simply God's plan B. It is a temporary solution to a temporary problem. It is not going to be present in heaven. And so we are not to wrap ourselves all up in that. Uh, secondly, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, something which the rabid Republican has a difficult time doing if they're meeting a rabid Democrat. I have had the, shall we say, the blessing of being at potluck a handful of times at some Adventist churches in an election year. And I have heard brothers and sisters who just might be rooming next to each other in heaven go at it hammer and tongs over the latest dispute between their two parties. Now, I, I, I have news for you. There are Democrats in this room. There are Republicans in this room. There are people that voted for the Green Party in last election. There are those that voted for Ross Perot when he was running for office. There are all types of people that lean particular ways. And we're, when we all get to heaven, we're all going to have to get along. Isn't that a shame? Isn't that a shame? It's terrible. No more elections. Boy, you know. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. That's right. Amen. Amen. We, so often, when we closely identify ourselves with a political party, it is all too e easy to demonize the other side. 
And I got to tell you, those are your Christian brothers and sisters, many of them. You can't do it. You cannot do it. No one gets a pass just because it's an election year. Your allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus Christ. Oh, and lastly, uh, Romans 14.22 says, Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. If you actually register with a party, it is assumed, rightly or wrongly, that you agree with the party platform. The plat party platforms are published. I mean, they, these, these are not like secrets. They're, they're all out there. And the reason they do that is because if you're a registered member of that party, you are expected to be supporting that platform. Well, the Bible says don't uh, condemn yourself by what you approve. It is assumed you approve of the whole thing. And I'm pretty sure no matter what the political party is, there are things on their platform that you as a Christian cannot fully endorse. So don't put yourself in that predicament. Uh, Ellen White is actually very explicit. Don't join a political party. Don't do it. We are to use our vote. We are to influence, but not to too closely identify ourselves with various political parties. Number three, consider religious liberty issues first. I'm not going to repeat all this. Just simply say, when you go in November, whatever it is, please, 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 follow the Bible's counsel and make sure that you have assessed accurately what the various candidates will do with regard to religious liberty. It's the most important thing. Number four, be civil, respect the government. Now that's hard sometimes, isn't it? Especially in the culture that we live in. Uh, we live in uh, the kingdom of snarkiness. Uh, we can make jokes and, and uh, we, uh, we get a lot of uh, mileage out of, uh, uh, out of politics. There is nothing wrong, and in fact, you should critique the government. That, that's, that's, part of, of, uh, that's part of good, solid, biblical principle. If there is a political leader that is doing wrong, if they're sleeping in the wrong bed, if they're stealing money, whatever it is, yes, they deserve the criticism of their constituents, even if they are Christian. Absolutely. But we have to be careful. Because, again, if we get swept up into the fervor of politics, particularly in an election year, it is easy to say things that if that person... We're actually standing next to us, or let's make it even stronger. We're sitting next to us at church. You know, we might still say the same things, but we might say it in a little bit different tone. And we might say it maybe with a little bit different uh, contextualization. We might be a little kinder in how we express it. I confess, sometimes this is difficult for me, because there's so much opportunity to go the wrong way. But we are Christians. We don't leave that behind when we engage, to whatever extent we do, with politics. And number five, lastly, ultimately, vote in such a way that the government can keep an appropriate peace so that Christians, not the government, can continue to spread the gospel. Amen. Now that may sound terribly simple. You know what? It is. It is. It is over the last 30 or 40 years, and it's not the only time I understand, but this is just the most recent example, when, when, when too often Christians have gotten too closely intertwined with politics, and it's made a mess of things. It's made a mess of our witness for Jesus Christ. You know, you know the government isn't going to fix it. It's not utopia creating uh, manufacturing device. It's not going to do that. Jesus Christ is the one who changes hearts. And so God in his wisdom said, with the stoning of Stephen, the theocracy is done. I now give civil government, I now give it an admittance for civil government to hold the power of the sword, not to enforce a religious dogma, but simply to keep bad behavior under control. This will enable there to be an environment that does not promote any one particular religion, but nonetheless in which religion can thrive if my people are faithful. This is the environment that every Bible-believing Christian, I believe, ought to be voting to create. This is the purpose of government, and this is how we should respond. You see, ultimately, when it comes to a presidential election, here in an election year, our job primarily is not politics, but instead proclamation of Jesus Christ. He is the one that will make the difference in our hearts, and ultimately, if there is a difference to be made, in our nation.
It is Jesus Christ that we as Christians must lift up even when we're pushing a button or checking a box in a ballot box. It is Jesus Christ who is at the center of whatever it is that God wants to do on this planet. We must pray for our leaders. We must lift them up even if the one that we wanted to win doesn't win. We need to express gratitude for the space that we still have, the religious liberty that we still have left, and we must lift up Jesus Christ as the one and only hope of the world. May the Lord bless each one of us as we go to the polls in November. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have placed us here in the country that we are in. The United States of America, Lord, for all of its flaws, uh, is still a place where religion can thrive. We see threats, Lord, on every side to that, but we are grateful for the moment that those freedoms remain. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to remain as long as possible, that you would work through us, Lord, and yes, that you would work through our government leaders to preserve that wall of separation between church and state, Lord. Not freedom from religion, Lord, but freedom to freely pursue the dictates of a person's conscience, Lord, with regard to you. I pray that this openness would last, that the harvest might be great. Lord, I pray for this presidential election. Lord, I don't think anyone here, Lord, would, would claim to know uh, the particular person that you want to be there. Uh, there's still an awful lot left to go. But I pray, Lord, that as we move closer to that time, that we would use your wisdom as expressed in your word, and that we would act as you would act were you in our shoes. Be with our leaders. Bless President Obama, Lord, our legislators. I pray for all of those in government that they might indeed, Lord, maintain this openness, that your gospel might be freely preached. Thank you for being the answer to all of our questions and problems. For we pray this in your name. Amen.